Hi, everybody. Um, so today we're going to take a little bit of time and talk about uh, customizing digitally fabricated restorations. So let me start sharing my screen with you guys. Uh, hopefully you guys can see this. Um, with this particular restoration that we're starting with, this was a digitally fabricated restoration, but the teeth utilized here were carded teeth, right? So the, the base was printed and the reduction was done digitally uh, on one area right here. And the teeth were actually um, cemented into the base. Now, it doesn't matter if you do it on this type of restoration, or let's say, for example, you got something like this, where you have a completely monolithic restoration, where you also did the cutback digitally and just refined it by hand. The application is very similar to that. And if we go further down, well, we got something that's made completely an analog, where you just process the denture with acrylic, and then you do a manual cutback and lay the, uh, the colors in. Uh, by hand as well, it's still pretty much the same principles. It's just the reduction is a little bit different and the post-processing can be a bit different as well. Okay, so let's take a look here. So I've listed and I showed kind of all the steps that we're doing uh, for this particular case. Now this case was an analog case, but don't like, don't be discouraged. It's pretty much the same process. So if you see right here, the reduction was done with a burr and you can see the burr marks. If you take a Digital restoration, as you can see right here, the reduction is primarily done digitally because it's so much easier, and I'll show you here in a minute how you do it, to do the bulk of reduction and very uniform reduction with the digital restoration. And by the time your base is printed or milled, you end up with a very good platform to you add for the addition of the colors. Now, the colors can be added either with composite uh, if you do a reduction, if you don't want to do any type of reduction and you're dealing with a monolithic restoration or you're dealing even with a pink restoration, then you can utilize optiglaze colors and we'll talk about that for in a minute as well. Okay, so I've uh, made a little video that I'm going to kind of uh, fast forward uh, in, in some areas on. Uh, now, this was an actual hybrid case that was going to be picked up later on on tie basis. Uh, but the restoration was designed, and this particular one I actually designed, uh, did the setup by hand, and then just simply scanned in the restoration with my uh, desktop scanner. And then you see right here, I'm utilizing a mesh mixer software, which is a free software that you can just download from the internet. And then uh, I'm uploading the STL file that I've exported from my uh, scanning software. And I'm choosing um, the option to select, but not on the brush mode, I'm using the lasso mode. And if you see, I'm going right by the teeth. I don't want to go too close to the teeth because when I do that reduction digitally, it ends up being um, a little bit problematic because it can cut into teeth and create holes. So I'm actually uh, pulling away about a millimeter from the tooth and I'm going forward, making those lasso attachments all the way around. Now, when I'm going to the bottom, what I try not to do is go all the way to the bottom. With a hybrid type of restoration like this one, it might not be a big problem because it's not really uh, having to rely on tissue support to um, uh, to create stability for the prosthesis. Uh, but if you're doing a tissue supported one, the reason you want to stay away from the bottom edge is because that's the area for your border molding and such. So it's very important not to mess with that. For hybrid, you can go lower if you need to. I'm just so used to doing it a certain way that uh, I want to make sure that I don't interfere with other things that I've have prepared. Okay, so you simply uh, go all the way through, and then you select the uh, the area that you need to. Uh, once you've done that, you go into uh, the edit mode. Well, here I'm smoothing the boundary because if you press O and you press B on your keyboard consecutively, you'll actually smooth out the boundary. And then right here, you can see I went into the offset mode and actually offsetting the area that I want to um, add composite to. Now, in this case, I've made a little mistake here and I put 0.55 millimeters. What that does actually offsets to the positive end. Uh, what I should have done, and I do that here in a second, is you want to put minus 0.55, or I've actually done it as little as 0.3. Depending on how much composite you want to add and how much substructure you're trying to hide, you can go from anywhere to 0.3 to 0.5. That should be sufficient enough for you to layer all the composite to create that. Now you can see I've did the minus 5, minus 0.5, and it offset everything. What I've done actually in, in, in later 
uh, later times is that uh, here this video doesn't show it but you can also go in and choose in the scope mode you can choose one of the brushes and just smooth out these areas just in case you don't want to be uh, doing the finishing touches by hand after it's been printed in my case I've done it both ways it really doesn't take a lot of effort to smooth out these areas if you want to add composite okay now once the area has been reduced if you're dealing with a milled uh, or a processed restoration you want to sandblast it when you're dealing with a printed a lot of times those little areas those little waves that you get from the prints are to be sufficient enough for your uh, mechanical retention of composite to the restoration uh, if you want to be sure i would still sandblast everything uh, what i usually use is a 50 micron aluminum oxide particles at about uh, 15 to 20 psi pressure sometimes you can go a little higher it's up to you um, with my kind of sandblaster i generally don't have any issue of getting on the teeth if you're worried about uh, damaging the actual teeth that you're if you didn't print the teeth for example if you are using carded teeth and you're afraid that you are going to end up um, damaging the surface of the tooth you can take and you can paint uh, a little bit of latex paint on top of the tooth and that will protect things out and you can buy just regular uh, dental stuff or you can buy makeup latex from amazon which is fairly inexpensive and paint it on there okay so once you've painted everything on and sandblasted everything you need to clean your prosthesis if you don't um if you don't clean your prosthesis the particles that are on there are going to interfere with your aesthetics mostly because they're not gonna uh, you're not gonna have too many issues with bonding uh, but uh, the statics, you can have little black lines there. Now, if you're milling or if you are doing a conventionally processed denture, you want to make sure to clean it with a steam of some sort. And then once you, you do that, uh, you want to make sure to completely dry the restoration. And I usually do that by uh, placing it into a dehydrator or you can use hot air. Now, if you're doing a digital type of restoration that you've printed, uh, I usually just clean it with alcohol. The reason we don't use alcohol on acrylic uh, because it can, can create uh, micro fractures in there but with printed uh, restorations it's not an issue because we obviously clean it with alcohol when we uh, post process it okay once you've done it this is a very important step that you want to utilize it's the composite primer okay with a composite primer uh, it creates that little sticky layer that allows for your composite to be added on now just be careful this is just for composite this is not for the glaze not for optiglaze optiglaze is a little bit different process and we'll talk about this in a minute okay once you apply the primer don't put a lot of it on there just do a small coat just to make sure wet all the areas you're going to be applying a composite to and you like cured for about a minute there's a different type of primer also called an acrylic primer that's used primarily for acrylic restoration but composite primer the reason i like to use that is because you can be use it on the Print it, you can use it on milled, and you can use it on regular uh, press back restorations as well. Okay, like you for one minute, and then you're ready to apply your, uh, apply your composite. You can try to do it in layers if you want to. Like in this case, I've done it in layers. So one layer, second layer, third layer, and you kind of quickly tack cure it between the layers for about a minute, just to, so they don't shift. When you're dealing with a printed monolithic restorations, chances are you're probably going to be doing everything in one layer so you don't have to worry about it just apply it and then cure afterwards once you tack cure everything you want to apply some kind of air barrier in order for that sticky uh, layer of inhibition to be removed chemically now you you, you can use the gradi air barrier or you can use some kind of um, ultrasound gel to put on there you're pretty much trying to suffocate that layer and make sure that uh, no um, no air gets to it and that stickiness goes away. Now, if you're using a specific light curing unit that has, for example, a vacuum chamber or a nitrogen chamber, that will uh, take, replace this right here and you won't have to worry about having to apply this kind of air barrier, okay? Once that is done, I'm a big fan of glazing my restorations and I'll show you here in a minute why. But the way I do it is once I've applied and I've, uh, and I've uh, cured my, Gradia Plus, what I will do is uh, polish it slightly with pumice just to get rid of any kind of sharp peaks if there are any, and then I'll uh, clean it and sandblast it with the same aluminum oxide. And once I do that, um, I clean it again and I dry it. As you can see, this is completely dry. 
and then I'll apply my OptiGlaze. Okay, in this case, I'm using OptiGlaze uh, OptiGlaze Color Clear uh, from the kit, but you can use the Black Bottle OptiGlaze as well. Um, just important to note that OptiGlaze cures at a different wavelength than uh, Gradia Gum Plus does, or Gradia Gum for that matter as well. So you want to have a curing unit that has bo both wavelengths. Okay, so for OptiGlaze, you want something that goes from about 365 to um, to about 405, and for the composite, you want something that goes from about uh, 420 nanometers to about 485. Now, I'm using the Labolite Duo that has both of them. If you're using a different kind of curing unit, you need to check and make sure it has uh, both things in there, okay? So, and uh, also the thing with composite and, and glaze, glaze is is a nanofill composite as well, right? So, uh, if it gives you a shine that's a little bit fake, especially when you do the teeth, like in this case, I don't do anything with the teeth because I didn't apply any composite to the teeth. I just applied it here, so I don't place the glaze here. But if you apply it and it's a little bit too fake shiny, you can use a little buffing wheel to dull it a little bit and just use a high shine polish to reshine the tooth and, and the base to give it that nice, more natural uh, polishing look, polished look that you get with just polishing acrylic. So it works on both the printed and, and handmade registrations as well, okay? Now you see for in this case, particularly, I just did a little side right here, but you can see a printed base. In this case, I was using the Dreve, uh, Dreve uh, uh, base material, uh, transparent rose, and digital cut back as I showed you before. And I just layered several colors of um, composite in there. So the biggest thing people usually talk about is the aesthetics associated. There's a couple of things, longevity and aesthetics, right? And longevity, they're constantly improving materials and everything else. Uh, but everybody's like, well, aesthetics, uh, it just looks, doesn't look good. In my opinion, aesthetics is not an issue. I can take a digital restoration and I can make it look uh, good with composite. I've been doing that for years with uh, regular restorations that I've been pressed back and just been doing it in an analog way. We've been cutting it back and adding, adding composite to them. And with this case, I'm doing the same pro procedure. It's actually only easier for me because... Uh, the base is actually printed and I don't have to press back and everything else. Teeth, you can do printed teeth or you can use stock teeth. There are many different ways of ap applying it. There are some limitations when you're using carded teeth and we can talk about it maybe in, in, in different uh, different times. Today's webinar, unfortunately, we don't have enough time to cover all those subjects. All right. Now you can see that the, uh, this is the other OptiGlaze that I usually put on the base. Uh, this is the the one in the black bottle. It has a little bit more, uh, it's got about 15 milliliters of stuff in there. So important thing to know with OptiGlaze, OptiGlaze does not like it when you apply a thick coat on there, right? When you apply a thick coat and you try to cure it, it, will, it can change colors on you, it can yellow on you. So if you apply a really thin coat with a brand new brush, I always use either a disposable brush or a new brush that I get from like Hobby Lobby or something, because I don't want any kind of contamination in there, okay? Um, OptiGlaze does not like to have any kind of composite primer underneath it. So if you take your restoration and you prime it with a composite primer that I showed you earlier, you're going to have issue because OptiGlaze will not cure properly. OptiGlaze does not also cure properly if you use a curing light that is made for just composite. If it doesn't have the lower wavelength that you want to use, it will not cure OptiGlaze properly, okay? Now, oftentimes I've been talking to people and like, well, if I put it on my denture tooth, it turns yellow and no matter what I do, I can't change that. So I made a little experiment myself and because I talk oftentimes about proper curing techniques, I sandblasted just one side of the tooth and I've applied OptiGlaze on it and I asked them if they could tell which tooth I did it to, well, since they saw the previous picture, they obviously could tell it was number eight, right? But for me, I couldn't tell the difference. So when they say, well, I could tell right away. And then I ask them, so which other tooth that I put it on? And oftentimes people can't tell. I actually also put a number seven as well. So to me, if you do the proper application and if you do it uh, with proper curing and there's no any kind of contamination down to it, you can get a fairly decent result. So you can see right here, this tooth was done right here, and this tooth was done on the mesial, okay? So on monolithic, it's pretty much the same thing. The only difference is that at the end, 
you're going to end up placing optic glaze color in order to give life to your um, restoration because the teeth when you print them as is they generally look pretty dull and you want to add a little bit of you know pizzazz to it as i like to say so for this particular illustration the composite was placed with the steps that i showed you already and uh, the only difference is now we have to work on the teeth and this is what i generally use now if you are working with optiglaze color and you matched uh, and you're trying to match uh, vita shades it's actually not that difficult all you have to do is you pick the uh the base color material that's slightly lighter than let's say you're using a1 you want something lighter than a1 and you just kind of uh, start applying colors now you hear here i was using um uh, white to uh, accentuate the the incisal edge and a little bit of uh gray or violet um on the incisal edge also to show the translucency so you can get a fairly decent aesthetic result with just using optiglaze if you want to uh, kind of give it a lifelike restorations now a lot of you guys are not going to be doing that a lot of you guys are going to be doing like prototypes where you're going to just deal with pink and we'll talk about that in a minute uh, but it, let's say for example the reason why i also like optiglaze color kits is because oftentimes in the laboratory a case comes in and it's for same day repair for example and it's the shade d something 2785 uh, whatever you want to call it something that doesn't exist in your cabinet uh, because the patient uh, had this denture for 40 years and the acrylic has changed uh, got stained and changed 50 million times and now you want to put something in there but it stands out like a sore thumb and now with optiglaze color i can darken things i would lighten them if i need to if i can let a little white and, and increase the value a little bit on that fairly easily and that repair works out pretty well so i've done that quite a few times as well okay for some of you guys you will be printing let's say you got a, a restoration that you are doing a um a healing denture i do those quite a bit actually where the patient is uh was an immediate they want to create something and that's going to stay in there while the patient heals and then once all the healing has taken place they want to do something permanent because oftentimes the reason why we do those types of restorations digitally is because the patient comes in and they have really badly periodontal involved dentition and taking excuse me and taking a traditional impression is almost impossible so they end up scanning that case uh, with an interval scanner and i get those scans sent in and i design well there's two ways you can do this you can either completely design it digitally and you can print uh, a restoration that you can uh, tint um, or you can create a digital model which you can replicate and duplicate in stone and go the analog way it, it's up to you there, there are two ways of doing it i'm personally a fan of combining workflows using digital where it works and using analog where i when i need it in this case a scan was sent to me uh, for an immediate i design a full upper and lower and now i have to uh, customize the restoration a little bit now, if you look closely the outside of this was done in composite and you don't have to do that in composite if you're just trying to get something done you can do something like this which i did on the palette so it creates a fairly a uh, fairly natural looking pink color like a light uh, type of acrylic and the way i achieve it i use two drops of red optiglaze two drops of pink optiglaze which is the bottle right here and two drops of of uh, of clear and i mix it all together and when i apply it over a uh, a base it creates that light colored um acrylic look so it works fairly well and uh i don't have any uh, issues with it the only thing is that once you've applied the colors you want to do a clear coat of optiglaze on top of it in order to uh, protect your restoration okay now i was asked a lot of questions over time when i first started i started using composite about 2013 and i've got a lot of uh questions coming up and say well you put it on dentures doesn't it break over time doesn't it separate it leaks so i've i've done some tests where i've applied composite in this case it was actually still the old gradia so the newer stuff that we use the gradia plus is actually even better so i took an acrylic tab and i applied it and then glazed it and then actually what i did is i actually uh broke it uh with my press and i could see in close-up there were no delaminations obviously there were crack lines because i was breaking things but the acrylic did not uh delaminate from composite so i knew that the bond 
was pretty strong on that. And when it comes to glazing things instead of polishing it, why I like to glaze my restorations? Because I did some tests as well where I took a bunch of samples and I applied a composite on it and some uh, uh, glaze and some actually just polish. And what I found out, if I apply composite to things and I didn't glaze it and I try to really well polish things, if you look closely, right on the edges where the margins are, if it kind of overlaps those margins, it's really difficult to polish those areas. So you see right here, it picks up stain. So if you do the same type of restorations like I did here and you, you sandblast it and you actually apply glaze over the same period of time, like I put the samples in T, over the same period of time, it does not create these issues, okay? So one thing I wanna to talk to you about again to make sure you guys understand my point, with OptiGlaze, you do not want to have any kind of sticky layer uh, of inhibition underneath it or you don't want to have something uh, that has the composite primer, which creates that same sticky layer. Like in this case, this is exactly what I did. I have applied primer first, and then I applied OptiGlaze, and it looks okay when you cure it, but if you take your fingernail, and you try to scratch it, it scratches right off, because we have that uh, contamination in there, okay? So it's very important to have it nice and dry, nothing else applied to it. If you're using composite, for example, like a Gradia Plus composite, which has a highly filled ceramic, uh, type of uh, matrix, then you can use a ceramic primer, which you see also makes, that will make the uh, the OptiGlaze uh, work better, but at the same time, it won't interfere with anything and, 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 and create a better restoration, okay? So with on ceramic, uh, highly filled ceramic composite, you can use ceramic primer and then apply OptiGlaze and you get good results but never use composite primer because it creates results like these, okay? Um, this is just another point I wanted to make. When you're trying to polish things by hand, when you have a restoration like this and you're trying to hand polish it, no matter how hard you try, these little areas right here, you're gonna have a really hard time by hand polishing it. Now this was glazed and you can see that it just preserves everything, especially with restorations that you're gonna be placing um, intra-orally and they're not removable like hybrids or doctor removal only, this is very important to do. Like in this case, for example, sometimes you can't do it analog at all. Sometimes you just have to do things digitally. Uh, like this particular patient is a, uh, has primordial dwarfism, so no teeth out there you can use stock teeth to make this restoration. So we actually had to take a library of teeth and scale them down when fabricating this particular restoration, okay? So you see right here, the teeth are very scaled down. And then I took composite and I actually adjusted uh, the base. Now you can see that I did a cut back here. The top is I'm using just OptiGlaze because I don't want to mess with that little seal area. And on the uh, on this part right here, I'm using composite. I'm using two colors here. And here I'm just using OptiGlaze and the whole thing is actually glazed as well to protect it. So you see I got a fairly decent look for something that's an immediate denture and done digitally. And this particular case could not be done analog at all, or almost not, because you, unless you make your teeth from crown and bridge individually, you could not get the results that you wanna get, okay? Now this hybrid uh, uh, pr prototype, in, in some cases I get patients that we're not sure about occlusion, we're not sure about aesthetics, and we wanna make sure to uh, give them something they can wear at least to try things out. In this case, we've print a restoration here, that we're going to, we've cut back digitally and then I smooth this out and I've actually layered composite. Um, patient wore this for about two months and then we can move on and create a more permanent type of restoration. So it's a fairly easy way of getting the results that you want. And this one is actually the latest case that I did. Um, I barely finished this one, I think about two weeks ago. Um, here I'm using uh, GC, um, resin, DC temp resin, and I think this one is the light one. Um, I've printed this on a bit, bit, bit of a faster setting. Uh, that's why you see the lines. Uh, it has to do with the way you align the print and then also the, the layers. The thicker the layer, the more pronounced the lines are going to be. Uh, but I didn't worry about it because I knew I was gonna be covering things with OptiGlaze and composite. So here you can see that I just did the composite here in, in, uh, in one color. And the teeth are uh, were adjusted with OptiGlaze, and the base on the very top and on, and on the palatal and the lingual surface was adjusted also with that mixture of OptiGlaze color that we talked about. And I was able to actually, because they wanted uh, down the line to have a backup, I was actually able to print two 
and I did two of them just in case one of them fractures or they lose one or they have to adjust one for healing and the next one they're going to pick up with maybe implants. It's really easy to make duplicates like that. So digital is a very uh, cool way of doing things. Um, I really like utilizing in my practice. Uh, there's a lot of things I do digitally now that I didn't do before, like base plates and custom trays. Duplicate dentures is my favorite thing to do because uh, with a, with when you're utilizing a patient's old denture, you can create some really cool results with a newer one. So to me, uh, digital has worked pretty good. So at this point, I think I'm gonna uh, stop with the slides and uh, we have about five minutes left and I'm gonna uh, answer some questions uh, for you guys if you have any. So uh, please go ahead and ask. Thank you, Eugene. We do have two questions. The first is, can you apply Gradia or Optoglaze to a flexible denture? That's uh, that's a very interesting point. Um, so the thing with with something like composite and some glaze, right? They don't have a lot of flex to it. Uh, if you end up applying it to um, a restoration that has a lot of flex to it, what you're going to end up having is just things are going to start cracking on you. Like even if you don't see it right away over time, and it's a fairly short period of time, um, things will just delaminate completely. Now, if you're just doing optiglaze, it'll probably just have cracks and full flake off. And if you're doing composite, it'll definitely just kind of completely delaminate and fall off of it okay the next one is can you tissue condition immediates what's the longevity so with tissue conditioning immediates i've had a, a decent result with utilizing um uh i've used gc uh soft liners that are silicone which is not a tissue conditioner i understand that but i was actually applying a composite primer before applying that and I have a feeling and I'm actually not just a feeling because we've had this similar conversation on Facebook with some people and they said they utilize printed and they use tissue conditioners for immediates all the time and they don't have any problems I don't know specifically which um, uh, which uh, type of resin they used uh, but something tells me uh, because of the uh, the ridges on the prints I don't think you can have too many problems with tissue conditioner. I can do a little bit more research on it and get back to you if you'd like. Um, you can contact me on Facebook through Messenger or you can email me at appledentallab at yahoo.com. So I, I'll, I'll be able to give you a little bit more information down the line. Great, the next question is, what is the process of application of composite to a metal substructure? So the way you actually apply composites to, to metal substructure is very similar to acrylics. The, the difference is you will actually be utilizing a different kind of primer. So uh, you can use uh, metal primer or you can use like GC makes metal primer. I think they make metal primer Z um, and uh, you can use the, um, the multi-primer as well. So what you basically do is you take your substructure, you sandblast it, uh, and you clean it up and I usually just use alcohol to clean it up you don't need to use any kind of water and then you air dry it to make sure it completely evaporates and then when I apply my metal primer I don't need to light activate it I just place it on there and let it air out once I've done that I usually do about two coats just to make sure then I will start applying my uh, usually my opaque is the first thing I apply because I want to make sure to block out the grayness away from it so once I apply my opaque I can light cure it and then start applying uh, my composite right over the top of it. So that's pretty much the whole process for, for metal. Everything else is pretty much similar to what I've showed you guys already.